What's up? It's Darren Rose. This is Inside Radio and Records. A glorious day here in Los Angeles. Join by Brian Klein. Now, before I give Brian a proper introduction, uh, he's in the managerial business. Band manager. You're already not giving me a proper introduction. <laughs> I should. What? Adult Wrangler? Is that better? <laughs> Something like Adult that. babysitter? Uh, also a family man. I got to say, well, everybody out in the industry, in the music industry, was at South by Southwest last week. You were at home with your mother in law's grandmother. Your, I'm sorry, no. your, your mother in law, your, your wife's. Mother and no, my m- wife's grandmother came and visited us uh, for the week. So. And what did you guys do? I oh, want to start man, there. I feel like we did a lot. I mean, she she does, she has a lot of energy. So we went to the beach, you know, for sure. We did that. Um, how, old is, how old is she? Eighty five. Eighty five. Eighty six next week. Yeah. yeah, traveling all by herself. Everything, you know. That's great. So you know, Ari- my wife Ariel Varenis, arielvarenis dot com. Um, She's a singer, so oh, I'm going to plug her like nine times. Yeah, do this it, thing. absolutely. Um, she's a fantastic singer. She really is. You um, don't manage her, do you? I do. Oh, no. do you? Husband manager. Okay. <laughs> I am. She, yeah, oh, she's babe. fantastic. Um, yeah, she's been. We've been all over the place. I think she's at the Getty Villa today, and you know, that's great. Does she tour? Does she like do the? traveling singer like full on who her grandmother no your wife i'm sorry <laughs> yeah she'll play shows in new york she plays at the iridium she plays shows out here but um she is also an animal activist as well i think you are by just having two dogs right and you know. they'll be all over us today i don't care i love dogs but uh brian klein once again thank you for coming down from malibu Thanks for we having me. We talked about getting over the border. That's not easy. No, but and I went through the valley, so that's a good way to go. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we also talked about how you did not miss South by this year. The, no, it's been several years since you've probably really missed it. In fact, I think that was probably the first time you and I met because I interviewed Fitz and the Tantrums was at South by Southwest at. Uh, it was on the Roxy. You know, the Roxy does their show down yeah. there. And it was like there were sound checks going on. It was a typical South by interview. There's You're screaming. You're trying to do an interview, and you're screaming over music. And, you know. I'm sure Fitz killed it, too. He, he's well, a he, good interview. He's a great interview. And Noel. They're, and really, they, they, they're excellent. Yeah, their chemistry is insane. Yeah. But we'll get back to you managing uh, Fitz. We'll get back to uh, Joe Purdy. Uh, you're currently working with Tim from Rage Against the Machine. He's yeah. got a new project on. And then Ariel Varenis at arielvarenis.com. Yes, the uh, the better half of yeah. Brian Klein joining us today. Sure. Uh, let's go way, way back to uh, you being a youngster. Did you? What, what, what did Brian Klein wake up as a young man and say, you know, I, this is what I want to do when I grow up? I think it was. I was in high school. I wanted to be a producer. I only had no idea what that was. You wanted to be a, a music producer yeah. or, or film? Okay. Yeah, not film. Yeah. Uh, music. <laughs> Uh, I had uh, buddies of mine were in a band in high school, and I used to go to their house every day after school and watch them rehearse. And I got really excited about live music and creation and all that kind of stuff. And um, I started taking classes at night during high school for um, engineering at a studio. Okay. So, um, which kind of like brought me out to Los Angeles. Did you play instruments? I did. I played piano, but I wasn't good at all. I had a horrible timing. So you, that's interesting because of all I've talked to a lot of artists, I never hear. And I've talked to producers, too, because usually they come from either, like, kind of a tech computer side of things, mm-hmm. uh, kind of an audio file, or they're more from uh, instrumental. They were musicians, and they just w- end up going producing. But you knew you wanted to, like, get in there and know. mix things up. I just loved opening up an album and, like, smelling the artwork and looking at all the credits. And I just – I didn't know what an A&R person was, so that was off limits. And manager, I didn't really – it didn't connect, but you then still don't know what they do. I have no idea what they do. <laughs> I don't know what A and R people. Do. I, I do. Um, kind of yeah. no. The That's good, a the good ones. Job anyway. I have a good A and R person for my class, but yeah. um, I uh, I did know that I liked being in a room where people were creating. Yeah, and I got off on that, you know. And we were incredibly high every time we went in there. So it was it was just a lot of fun connecting. With the creative aspect of uh, songwriting and uh, and just watching a band form and grow. And producers always get their check. I guess so, if you have a good manager. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I was going to say, if you if you get a producer credit on an album, chances are you're going to get paid on it. Whereas sure. you might you know, play a couple chords here and you might get left off credits. Yes, and, I know. And screwed who, out of millions. Uh, many people who do that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I don't know. I was I was starting to go to college in Connecticut and, you know, for me... Being there, um, 
it just felt like somewhat of a dead end. And the band that I'd been hanging out with uh, in high school and moved out here to L.A. Mm. And uh, I just I told my mother one day, I was like, I want to move to L.A. and I want to take this seriously and be a producer. So I came out here and started taking classes at UCLA for that and then quickly decided that I didn't want to uh, be in a, in a small room all day in, in a dark small room, you know. So it is that it, that's very true. DJs, I mean, guys in radio, guys in producing anything, editing, you're very isolated. You're in your little sound booth all day. Yeah, which is great, and I still enjoy going to studios. But um, for me, no, I mean, but he, some of those guys in there for twenty hours at a time. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, anyway, I, that wasn't for me. I started taking some business courses, and uh, I lucked out, and I started interning for a guy named Mark Geiger who was at the time at American Recordings in the a r department. Mm-hmm. So I'd listen to tapes for him during the day and kind of rate them. Mm-hmm. And um, and then on some of the odd days... Now, was that uh, pre-Rick Rubin? No, it was, that, was his yeah, company yeah, the whole time. Together, but Mark was yeah. like the head of A&R okay. at the time. But were He's you working like, with Rick, too, or was that... Not really. I, I mean, he'd come in once in a while, and I guess I would get a bucket of his tapes one, you know, here and okay. there. But, um, you know, I just kind of like was able to see what a record company was all about because it was all on one floor and all the departments were there and I kind of got a good grasp on what everybody did from marketing to radio and college radio versus, you know, commercial radio. Right. So it was super cool. Um, And then I was also working at a small management company for this guy Warren Etner and at the time he had Rage Against the Machine, Faith No More, L7, Failure, a bunch of bands. And I say small because... It was a boutique kind of like office. And, and for that era, too, for that. Yeah, well, the, you know, the management farms hadn't sprung up yet right, either. Right, right. You know, I think everybody was kind of independent at that point. Um, but I got to learn a lot in that office, too, and um, and kind of see bands, what they were doing on cycle, off cycle. And I was a big Faith No More fan, so I got to nerd out on all the um, rough mixes that would come in from some of their records and got to see rage make their record or at least kind of hear about it and yeah and that's i mean that was uh kind of how you started that relationship with tim and not really i oh, met really? him many years later i met him briefly back then and yeah. i was kind of scared of him because he's like he's a scary looking he's, dude yeah <laughs> but uh scary stories we became friends uh, or i became i managed him much later mark Geiger, that's like a legendary name rick rubin those are like big names what do you feel like you learned early in the business from those guys i was a kid i was 19 Going on, tw- you know, I just turned twenty, I think, when I just started with those guys. So, I don't know. I, I again, I didn't know what was what, who was who. I did did know Mark was like a pretty heavy dude um, with Lollapalooza, and he was an agent, and you know, he started you know the Ultimate Band List, which became Artist Direct, and I don't know. I just kind of saw that happening, and yeah. and it was cool. It was inspiring. You know, who did I, you look up to back then, coming up as a ma- early manager? As a for management, I don't know. I was I looked up to anybody because I was just a kid just trying to do it. You know, yeah. I, I was working at Aaron's Records at night. You know, I'd come home from the internship all day long, and I go to Aaron's and try to sell records over there, and that was kind of funny because I used to take all of the free stock that these companies would give me, <laughs> right. and then the you know hawk pieces. them over at at Aaron's and, and make some extra money. Yeah. So and I was literally living with like four other guys in a shitty place in Hollywood and. You know, trying yeah. to figure it out. How how I'm, I want to go back to like the college aspect because you said you went to school for uh, producing, you went to school for management, and you and a lot of it, it's kind of split in our industry in music. You even have guys that go to broadcast school, right. but then you have guys that just you know whatever find their way in uh, equal parts in the, as musicians. You have artists that are classically trained and mm-hmm. some that just taught themselves. Right. Uh, what's your take on that? Like, how do you feel it was? For you and I don't know. I, uh, it's obviously worked out for the best. But what what do you think you learned that maybe you wouldn't have learned going the other route of of just maybe because there's a lot of guys that just end up managing their buddies' bands and right. that's why they're managers because they're friend you know I won't name names friendager but exactly or familyager right <laughs> or husbandager exactly AerialVarenis dot com. So I guess the the ultimate question to this soliloquy is. What do you have maybe because of your background and experience from uh, traditional professional experience versus like 
you know, just somebody who does it by default. I don't know. I think, you know, look, I, I sh- probably should have finished school, but I dropped out and I didn't. And I think I had more time on the uh, traditional music business side than I would have if I just kind of started right out of, you know, college mm-hmm. and, or, you know, grad school, whatever I would have done. Um, so, you know, I've been in this now for 21 years plus. So I have a good kind of understanding of how it used to be and what the money that was involved back then versus kind of where you have to be right now and, and you know, what it's all about today. Money in terms of, uh, like, the realities of, of in yeah. what a band would take in versus... Well, no. I, mean, I think what uh, labels were willing to spend and fork over in the beginning of a band's career, you know, because they had a lot of it, you know. At that point, people were buying... They went from buying vinyl to buying the same thing as on a cassette, to buying the same thing on a CD, then they'd lose that. And, you know, they, they keep buying the same product over and over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even if you just wanted that one song, you spent 16, 17 bucks on an album. Right, you know, exactly. So the business, I think, was flush with money. And the bands that I was kind of hawking out there when I was a young manager, I was getting big deals for it. And we didn't have any fans. It just mm-hmm. didn't mean anything, you know. Was, but we got a lot of money up front. Well, what, what about the money... Uh, how has that fluctuated on in terms of syncs? Because you talk about uh, th- the very few sync licensing options, like commercials, uh, 20, 25 years ago. Those dollar figures, what are those compared to now? I mean, I, t- I don't know. I didn't have a band cool enough uh, or good enough back then to get a, a license. And if they did, they probably would say no because they, they still were, cool. were connected, you know, to you know uh, that era. The sellout. Well, yeah, anti sellout era. But now, I mean, it's way different. But um, yeah, I never, I never came across that because now. I feel like what what's happened is that the everything's flipped. Is because you know back then you were talking about you'd buy one album for one song and it would cost you fifteen to twenty bucks, right? Yeah. And that gets dispersed. Now you buy one song for ninety nine cents, and that's going to a lot of people. And there's nothing at the end of the day, really. Or if you stream one song. It's I mean, even it's fractions, even, fractions, fractions. It's even that worse. Yeah. Whereas now, that's not the money maker, but the money makers in the touring and the sync right. and six figure licensing deals. I think back in the the like the late eighties, early nineties, bands wouldn't make a lot on the road, or maybe they did, but you know some of them didn't care as much, and they'd spend a lot of money, right. but it was all in the record sales. So now yeah. it's completely flipped. You know, and like, and I also think there's like middle class artists now too. I think yeah. that like used to be starving artists, and then rock stars, right. and now there's like bands that have never been on the radio, could maybe never, you know, come close to selling out the Fonda, mm-hmm. but yet, yeah, they make a perfectly good living. They might do publishing. They might also do, uh, you know, they have a certain niche that supports them in some capacity. Well, my client Joe Purdy, who I've been working with for going on ten years well, now. Love, yeah. He um, he's a middle class artist, and he's smart about his business. He owns his masters. He owns most of his publishing. When we do a license, he gets all the money. Um, he could tour well, you know. Yeah, we don't. We're not on the radio. Maybe if we are, it's here and there. And you wouldn't recognize him walking down the street. Most people would. I would. <laughs> you would. <'cause> um, <laughs> but I'm saying. I manage him. But I'll tell you this: I know Joe Purdy. I've seen Joe Purdy live in concert. I know his music. I would not Joe know Joe Purdy if he was sitting next to me at a restaurant. Okay. Well, that's, 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 that's fine. fine. I'm sure he prefers that. Exactly. That's um, my point. And that, that's what makes them kind of a successful middle upper class artist. That, well, he's also put out 13 albums. You may yeah. or may not know that. Um, I've helped him put out, I think, close to 12 of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's sold over a million tracks on iTunes over the years. And that's for... A young artist, it's good money. And I'll you tell know? you the same. I'll tell you the same story that I told you about uh, the first time I ever saw Joe Purdy. He was opening up for Edie Brickell. Oh right, uh, at the Belly Up yeah. in San Diego, and it's one of maybe five shows I've ever been to where I heard a band, an artist, for the first time, and was so compelled by their music that I walked over and bought their CD and I bought uh, or their album and I bought Joe Purdy's Julie Blue. Yeah. Uh, which was recorded on a dock, I yeah. believe, in, in over like a two or three day period, upstate New York. I mean, beautifully written album, like so tranquil. You can hear like the water splashing up underneath between tracks. Well, he made that album 
Uh, he was he plays this annual um, fundraiser for uh, this River Island upstate New York every year, and he was struggling making a full his first full band album only four seasons for months I think and this is right before I, I kind of jumped on, but he told me that it was just kind of really you know weighing on him just the mixes and the writing and everything um, that he just took a break and made this album. And during this, I think J.J. Abrams called him and said, hey, could you write me a song about uh, being stranded on an island? And he said, yeah. He said, what do you think of this? And played him Wash Away over the phone. And I think that's kind of how, you know, Wash Away happens. Wow. And, and gotten the, one of the first main episodes of uh, Lost. Yeah. So. That's a great story. Yeah, no, it's great for him. And yeah. and we were talking before we hit record too. So one of the things that I've always been fascinated by, and I think probably a lot of you folks too, even in the industry, is valuation of music. Where uh, we obviously have a value of a song uh, on iTunes. I, I love, uh, you know, Money Grabber by Fitz. I'm going to go buy it. You know, if I like one or two songs off the album, off their what their current releases, I'm going to buy the whole album. Um, but then what's Did the... Did you not buy the first record and you just bought Money Grabber? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> I'm using an applicable example to I'm sell you some more records, trying, okay. hopefully here, along with uh, your your lovely wife. ArielVarenis.com. There you go. It's been a few minutes, so I wanted to get that okay, in there. Okay, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, the valuation of, of, of music as it becomes popular and, you know, syncing, licensing, whatever you want to call it, publishing in uh, to the masses, whether it's a commercial, a video game... A uh, TV show, a film, you know, uh, we're mentioning uh, the example of Hozier's Take Me to Church. Mm-hmm. How, you know, a year ago, that song probably could have made some movie trailers for five grand. Now it's six figures, you know, and, and that's happened with, uh, I know, with one of your artists, Fitz, quite a bit. What have you seen over the years? And, and Fitz, let's, we should actually tell the story of Fitz, is his background is in commercial production. And, and advertisement. Yeah, well, his background's been a songwriter for, you know, since he was a teenager. But, yeah, um, yeah he had a company where he wrote jingles and he was very successful at that, which I think makes him an incredible songwriter because of the versatility that you have to have in that business yeah. and how quick you have to be. That is a horrible whistle. I know, right? No. But, <laughs> um, but you know, with us... I think the fir- the first thing that we did with licensing early on before we signed with uh, a label, um, a friend of mine was a music supervisor and got two songs placed on damages on the TV yep, show. Damage. And so we took that money and instead of like, you know, trying to split that up, we um, we took it and made some uh, music videos out of it to, to kind of show what the band looked like and what they how they performed. So we did two live videos. Okay. And uh, so we kind of rolled that in, but yeah, that was it was like wasn't a lot of money. I feel like it was like eight grand or something, or mm-hmm. you know. But we we used that money to to build more uh, and, and create more content. It's, what's great about Fitz and there's other guys uh, I've had on here, Sebu from Capital Cities and Mikkel from Airborne Toxic, uh, L.A. guys for the most part. They're and they're all both friends with Fitz, by the way. All, all yeah, and they, all those guys know each other, and they're all kind of in that same contemporary. They're not. They're pop stars for the most part, but they're not your pop star that you or I would think of it like a Katy Perry or, or, you know, Christina Aguilera. These guys are like a gentleman of a certain age. They're not early 20s. But but what I'm saying is that there's very little ego in there. And I think that, like, uh, when you take your ego out of it, there's more of a chance for success because you're listening to more people. You're understanding and learning more. And I think... Uh, the business has rewarded that as of recent. Well, look, I think there's a certain amount of the right ego that you need in it to be kind of that A-type personality that drives. Well, of course. To, just and, to be on stage, you have to have an ego. Yeah. Right. But I think Fitz has that. I mean, Fitz is, you know, he's a really good businessman. He understands his business pretty clearly. And, right. uh, and uh, But so, there's not an arrogance is what No, I there say. isn't an arrogance. I think, uh, with, especially with him. Uh, he doesn't have that. No, he's yeah. an adult, and yeah. I, I like working with him a lot because of that. Yeah, but um, doesn't mean he can't go out and be a pop star. You know, he could be oh, a pop star. Absolutely, and we have has. another record com- coming up hopefully next year, and he'll be a pop star. Yeah. Well, let's talk uh, a little bit about the massive success over the last couple of years with the last record and mm. uh, two number ones. 
Two, yeah, two number one um, on alternative. Two number one on alternative, and they also back to back, which is remarkable. Yeah. I mean, for any artist to do, uh, and a lot of crossover too. I mean, it, you know. Yeah, we did well uh, at Hot AC and tried to dip our toes into pop a little bit, and AAA did well. Mm-hmm. So, and like, what's it's again? This is one of those questions where you know you never know what the secret sauce is or what the magic you know recipe is but what do you think it is that's happened to that band over the last five or six years because they for a long time they were you know an la band that that was fun and great live show but they didn't have that one hit or that one song that yeah we did that got to number one until (laughs) several albums down the road um second album um you just have to work your ass off. I don't think we had a, a, a record. The first one was like a crossover type of record where it was going to work an alternative. At least at the time, alternative didn't feel like it did. So but that's just, the answer. Yeah. I think it was. Here's, here's that's what I was, true because I think I was Money Grabber say, now kind of would do well. Well, that's what I'm saying is that it's a triple. I guess the question that I was getting at was that it's more of a. Their sound is more of a triple A sound. Was was was, but uh, now you would consider alternative. Because the really the definition of alternative is, is anything that's outside the mainstream of the norm, okay. right? But right, <laughs> sure. If that's that is the definition of alternative, but, how w- but alternative music right now, if you don't have guitars, you're, you're you're doing pretty well. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you mean if you do have guitars, you're. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, that's I what know. I'm saying. I, I w- it's like- I, I'm praying for more guitars in in you know alternative music, but um, you know what I think. As far as their success, they work their ass off. They go to radio stations every day, multiple radio stations. They do a lot of hard work. Yeah. My partner, Lisa, and I, Lisa Newpoff is my partner and has been from the beginning, and she's like, she's a force of nature. So between the two of us and the band and the label, agents, um, you know, it's really been a collective kind of push. But the band, they work their ass off, and that's kind of the whole crux of it, I think. Yeah. And it's and it was a and it wasn't an overnight success. I mean, that's sure. It was like one night it started happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, everybody always says, "Oh, it's a ten year overnight success," because everybody thinks that there's not a lot of hard work. It's like, oh, oh man. here's a guy that writes great pop songs. It's not, you know, it's 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 a long road. Yeah, no, I th- it was been a long road for him, but you know, he's really good at it, and so are the rest of the band members, and you know, it, it's the chemistry. It works. It's the time and. They're a fun band. They're, yeah. You're a great band live. Yeah. And you said they're working on new music? They're going to start working on new music. I mean, they're in, on tour this moment in South America playing Lollapalooza, and then uh, they're going to come back and start writing. They're going to play Coachella, which is kind of like the last thing on this record. Okay. And um, they get back at it. Yeah. W- how do you feel about oversaturation of an artist? I don't know that you can do that as much. Maybe you can in the pop world right now, but mm-hmm. as far as I'm concerned, you know, with fits, uh, you know, maybe some people get sick of the walker from hearing it from all these different um, places, but I don't know. I just want to, you know, I think they want to reach as many people as possible. Yeah. We, you know, the walker was the theme song for MLB postseason this year, and it got played and played and played. And it was like while we had a commercial at the time, and we also had a trailer going. So, you know, didn't bother me as much. I know some people on the publishing side on our team kind of, you know, took a deep breath and, and said, okay. But um, I think it benefited us because it was a different market that we were hitting. Absolutely. Well, and it goes back to that song valuation thing where you have a song that's already hit number one. It, it stocks high. So if the offers are still coming in, advertisers want songs that are familiar yeah. that they can kind of groove with. Uh, you know, we talked about Safe and Sound is another perfect example of these songs that just become kind of part of the our cultural landscape. Sure. And they're just so familiar. Uh, super I, NCAA basketball tournaments have been going on, and the Supercuts commercial with yeah, this. It's, it's amazing to me that somebody else wanted to license a song again yeah. for a commercial, but fine. You know, why not? No, that's great. You know? Uh and you started working with, let's talk a little bit about uh, Tim Comerford from Rage. Yeah. Uh, I, before we get to him, I want to ask about managing in general. I mean, uh, you've, managers, it's kind of like uh, a real estate agent. You know what I mean? Anybody can technically do it. 
and this is sure. Not- <laughs> Thank you. But anybody can do a radio show and a podcast. Exactly. I've always <laughs> said that. I go if anybody wants. I've always said. I go if anybody wants to get into a radio, they could go home, get two hundred dollars worth of equipment, and and do a show. But to do it good, yeah. You and you have had that success, and I think that like to be a real estate agent. You could do it. You could take your license, but are you going to be good? Are you going to be patient? It takes a special breed. I said at the top of the show about you're kind of an adult wrangler. I mean, you have to be. Listen, no. I mean, you know, my clients, I think, are mature enough. And, uh, you know, if you. And that goes to choosing the right clients. Yeah. I I mean, I used to work with a lot of people who were either on on drugs or too young, and that was terrible. Yeah. That that was really hard. And I won't. I won't do that again. How many bands total have you had your hands in? I have no idea. I mean, but I don't 100? go through. I, no, I don't go through 50? a lot of clown, clients. I did clown, clowns. <laughs> clowns. I don't clowns. go through a lot of clowns. Clowances. No, but I. You know, I was. I ended up at um, working with this guy Steve Stewart for years, and I was really lucky because he taught me a lot. He was managing Stone Temple Pilots at the time. Okay. You know, he taught me a lot, and he was another independent manager, and and I was able to bring some artists on and, and kind of learn that way as well under his roof um i forget what i was going with but uh i just feel like uh i don't i don't take on too much i I can't i have to be fair to the clients that i have so i'll take something on if it makes sense in the space of time that i think i have if it was another fits in the tantrums i'd blow my head off because i I don't have time for that you know and i don't have you know time to spare to to have a life outside of this if i if i do that you know so and because obviously you're there's you know, you have help, and but there's only one of you, really. Well, in, in the case of Fitz and the Tantrums, there's me and Lisa, who she and I are, are equal in that mm-hmm. partnership, and we work just as hard. And I might get up a little earlier than she does, and she might go get uh, go to bed a little later than me, but we cover a lot of ground yeah. for this band, which, you know, and very hands-on. You know, it's not like some of these management farms where you kind of get passed around desk to desk and, you know, you've just got a bunch of younger people working on you. You know, we're, we're pretty hands-on. Right. Um, so I'm lucky there. I, I always ask artists, how do you guys overcome conflict? You know, how do you... you I, well, that, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if that's an easier way to put it. Well, no, I think, you know, collectively with, with Fits and the Tantrums, we've, we we know where the places are to kind of... The, the pressure points where, you know, it's going to... F- things are going to flare up. So we, we try to avoid kind of going down that road with everybody and just make sure everybody's on the same page and everything's transparent and the communication's flowing. That's a very big part of uh, the Fits and the Tantrums organization. Right. Same with with Joe. He just wants to, you know, he, he wants to know what's going on. I'm not going to hide anything from him. And, and you know, he you want to be an advisor. You want to be somebody who your artist trusts to, you know, give advice to and, and, and bounce things off of or filter, mm-hmm. you know. So that, I, you know, I hope that, you know, I have that with them. And I, I also know managers that don't even do paperwork or contracts or anything with their artists. Do you have things pretty... It's different with every client. But, yeah, mostly we have paper. But it's, yeah. it's not, you know, for the end of the world, you know, it's 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 an agreement, there. you know. Yeah. And do you feel like managers are fairly compensated in general? I don't... Well, it depends what manager you're talking about. <laughs> I feel like I'm fairly compensated. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that a lot of managers, you know, percentages range from, you know, 15 to 25 percent on depending on the deal. I don't know any. I, I, I would love to meet the manager who takes 25 percent. Seriously. That's insane. I think what's also happens, too, is you get like these a la carte deals where you'll get like, uh, I'm going to manage you, but I'm also going to do a little bit of A&R and maybe I'll do a little bit of promo and maybe I'll get. I, I'm just saying yeah, I, yeah. Look, I, I I haven't been in that business with somebody. If I, I'm in it with somebody, I'm going to take the standard percentage based on whatever we discuss. That's going to be, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to try to wrap anything else into it because I think I need to make more money now. You know, versus long term. Um, with Fitz, you know, Lisa and I didn't make any money for the first year and a half, and but we stuck with it and, and figured it out. Right. You know? It's like we didn't charge him monthly for anything. We we weren't trying to wrap anything else into it other people may do that but i'm, I'm uninterested in that let's talk a little bit about radio i, I don't know oh yeah a wall nation is number two this week or they're they're charting at number two right now good for aaron and the yeah. boys well you know that's, i used to i used to manage aaron right we've talked well and that's the connection to burko who's burko's going, like so. one of the best people i know in the world burko's. love burko burko you're fucking awesome yeah you know? Uh, so Bur- Burko, current manager of a wall you you were with aaron back in uh 
the hometown hero days. <laughs> I learned a lot. It was the first band that I ever got signed to a major label that I managed. Um, and I, I co-managed with Steve Stewart, but it's the first band that I found that I really liked and said, hey, you know, and they were terrible. They couldn't write any songs. Aaron could barely sing. I'd go in the rehearsals with them and just kind of sit with them and, you know, work with them and, like, and tell them, you know, write a song right now and I'll come back in 10 minutes and let's see what it is yep. and that kind of shit. And um, I, I don't think I'm completely responsible for getting them in shape, but I definitely was somebody who was in the music business when they were still kids who were coming in and just, like, hammering them and encouraging them. So, you know, at the time, they didn't have any f real fans, but they were getting really good. Yeah, and there's actually a handful of – and he goes back into that – you know, he's not a spring chicken either. That goes back – 10, 12 years. I'm just blowing up everybody's age today. Exactly. Why don't I just put on Aaron Bruno's 52 years <laughs> old. He looks really yeah. good. And happy 67th. Thank Brian. you. I'm Thank so you happy very much. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no more ages today. We are all. How old are you? I am. Th how old do I look? You're, you can be like 36. I could be, but I'm 39. Hey, yeah. making it look good. Are you 39? Fuck no. How old are you? What are you 40? 41. 41. Yeah. Yeah. I would have said 42. Yeah, because it's all the gray. <laughs> it is the gray. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it's good. It's distinguished. It's distinguished. I blame it on arielvarenis.com. <laughs> the, the seven or eight people that watch this are well, just going to all You know what? I don't want to joke her. around. She is really good. When I met her, my sister was her field well, hockey coach in high school. No. Well, my, we're both from Connecticut, so I've been out here a long, longer than Ariel has. But um, she's a you know, powerful voice. So my sister went to see her play at the Malibu Inn one night. And um, she, my sister Dana, was uh, Ariel's field hockey coach in high school. So she's like, okay. you, she calls me up. You have to see my friend play. I'm like, okay, whatever. I, like I need to see another artist play. Right, 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 uh, like right, I had right, to add yeah, to yeah. my sister. I'm Last, still that big yeah. brother, little sister thing. And um, you know, I didn't end up missing a couple shows. And Ariel's just like, this guy's a dick. So she reached out to me. She said, uh, um, "Can I come and and meet you in Hollywood and pick your brand about the music business?" I'm like, sure. So she came out to Beachwood where I lived, and we went to La Poubelle. And this old gag. This old gag. And I we're heard hanging. this. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Dude. Can I hear a little bit about the music Let's, industry story? Exactly. You'd, be, uh, you'd have a dollar. Yeah. I'm kidding. Um, so she came out, and I'm sitting with her, and we're talking, and I was like, I, I didn't even listen to her. I was just like, holy shit. And I told her, I said, you know what? We're going to get married, and, but we can start dating soon. And I hadn't heard any music, really. I went to her website, and her website was horrible. It was like, it looked like something from, like, 1983. Right, right. <laughs> and so I, I, I didn't even, I don't think I can even play music off the website. That's how old it was. And um, so, you know, we started dating, you know, that whole thing for, like, months. And I finally saw her sing in Malibu at some event, and she blew my mind. She really? was fantastic. She's, like, a real powerhouse. So we... Uh, Years later, we, you know, we were engaged, we're getting, we're getting married, but um, we started a pledge campaign to make an album, and uh, we ended up getting Booker T. Jones to play on it, we got uh, uh -huh. Blake Mills play guitar on it, um, James Gadsden play drums on it, it's a serious album, so, you know, one of the things I was thinking of with her is she doesn't have a big audience, and I'm like, she loves dogs, and that's probably why this little guy's girl is, like, sitting right next to me here. Um, she's heavy into rescue. So yeah. I, was, I was like, you know what? Instead of trying to release this album the conventional way of, you know, trying to compete with other singers, let's partner up with different uh, animal rescue organizations and uh, put out the record to them and give all the money to them. That's a good idea. You know what else they need is a new song. You know that um, APC, uh, ASPACA or whatever it is yeah, that Sarah ASPCA. McLaughlin. Yeah. So they need a new theme song. Well, dude, so, we've got it. If you know anybody not, over it's there. It's not like a slit your wrist song that every time you see these damn dogs. No, you want to smile. You don't want to yeah. kill yourself. Give the flea bag some flea collars and call it a day. A little dude, shampoo. Dude, fleas are a big problem. So we ended up releasing this album through different organizations and she, now she has thousands of fans she can go play shows in new york or in la and a lot of people will come out that's great and that's and she's a middle class that's i, I would consider yeah. that to be a middle class artist right i think so too yeah i would call her middle class <laughs> upper class for you upper buddy. class for me she's she, top she's your top shelf 
She's, you know, she's, she, you know, but I'm not, you know, thank God she's a great singer because if she wasn't, I don't think we would have gotten engaged. Yeah. It would be so hard to fake that, you yeah, know, no, you're over right. and over. Right. Like, no, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, you're, you're great. great. You're great. I want to check out the, the new Tim project, Future User. Future User. And What's it, up with that? Tim Comerford, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, when I use the word psych- audio slave, audio slave, uh, when I use the word psychopath, I mean that in the best, most lovable way. But he kind of has that like. This guy's a fucking crazy person, but he also seems very intelligent. Yeah. And uh, obviously a brilliant musician, very uh, and opinionated and, and strong-willed. He is. He's all those things. And I think he's crazy in a really good way, you know, and uh, had a lot of fun. He and his partner, Jordan Tarlow, um, I got connected with them, I don't know, about a year and a half ago through Ian Rogers, who at the time was at um, Top Spin. He's now over at Apple. And uh, he's like, oh, you should check out this thing, and it's right around the corner for you, from you in, in Malibu. And I'm like, great, you know, I'll check it out. And I really just enjoy working with these guys, and we're just having fun. Um, and it's just been kind of nutty. We, you know, we've been making these crazy videos. We developed a character kind of like Eddie from Iron Maiden, and right. his name is Swim. Right. Someone who isn't me, and we got that name from like illicit drug forums online. Yeah, tell the story really quick about the. It's uh, steroids over heroin. No, no, it's hashtag steroids or heroin. Steroids or heroin. Sorry. Of the album. Uh, break that down really quick if you can. Or is I, it, you know what? I, I'd have to let Tim do that another time. I will get Tim on, and then we'll talk we'll, about we'll it. We'll get Tim on. Um, but uh, our, the first video that we made, you know, now Swim is in every video. This character, he's got a mask on, he's got headphones, and he's kind of like the ultimate demonstrator in, in, in everything. He's not good, he's bad, he's he's not evil, he's, you know, whatever. A badass. And he's kind of a badass because the first video that we put out, he he played tennis against John McEnroe and then uh, ended up waterboarding John McEnroe. Uh, and we really did waterboard John McEnroe for about an hour yeah. um, in Tim's place. And uh, it was pretty heavy. <laughs> Maybe it was close to two hours. But uh, watching a man cry after being waterboarded is pretty heavy. Wow. And a tennis and especially superstar. John McEnroe, yeah. Yeah, he's a badass. Yeah. So, um, so that was the first video. The second video that we put out. Um, and swim- these are all available now. Yeah, you can just go on YouTube yeah. and find them. The band is called Future User future-user.com um, the second video uh, swims a parkour athlete and he's being chased by these guys in city and everything and we had Stan Lee cameo in that one and Tim lights himself on fire at the end or swim does mm-hmm. um, so that was the second one oh, you just gave away the you just gave away the nut there ah shit well, well now you're it's two whatever. seconds away let's go swim in All the right, third video swim in the third video we're going through the supermarket late at night in Malibu and just grabbing food off the shelves and spraying vegetables with, with uh, different aerosol. It mm-hmm. was, you know, we, it was just total punk rock style. It was a lot of fun. Um, I had to watch guard to make sure that we didn't get ambushed by the security. Yeah. Um, but that one, um, that one was the third one. That was unplanned. Like he just ran in there. And did we that. just ran in. Yeah. Some people in the video are just kind of their reactions are hilarious because they're real and they're just like, looking like exactly they look uh? like what the fuck is this <laughs> in Malibu it was funny yeah. and then um, the fourth video is uh, Swim is a blood doping skateboarder and he's taking shooting heroin I'm sorry not heroin shooting steroids throughout the day and just thrashing through Southern California oh. and uh, we end up uh, Lance Armstrong's in that video um, and, and he's featured in the song as well so and what's the name of that one? Uh, that one is called Mountain Lion. Okay. And uh, AWOL Nation actually did a really cool remix of that as nice. well. Um, so he's in that. Um, and then we have another one coming up, which I can't talk about. It's going to be more insane than all of them. And, again, the project Future User with Tim Comerford from Regent's Machine, Audio Slave. Uh, what's the play? Is he going to do live shows? Is we'll gonna- see. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's got some other things he's working on as well, but, you know. We'll see. Yeah. Right now, we're just having a blast doing all this. It's it's a lot of fun. That's great. Yeah. What's a typical day for uh, a Brian Klein? And you you know you have your you don't always have bands that are in album cycle or active, but and I think that's kind of another misconception a lot of times with managers is that you know the mover, the shaker, the guy with the jacket full of. Uh, Various drugs and paraphernalia, but that's not you. No, you're my, a businessman. No, I, if I have anything, it's Advil because Tim like fell off his bike or something. Or kidding. Um, yeah. 
No, you, all your guys are very on the straight and narrow. No, it's- yeah, no, they are. They are. Look, I like to work. I love the grind. I, I really do. So even though t- uh, Fitz may not be on a full cycle this year, we're still going to be working our asses off for the band. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of different things that are going to come up and a lot of opportunities that we're going to want to look into, whether it's how we set up the next record or how we put out the next record internationally. Right. There might be some traveling involved in that to try to figure that out. It might be, you know, some, you know, finding a producer, find, maybe bringing in other songwriters. It, it could be... You know, setting up artwork, photo shoots, I mean, you name it. So there's a lot to do even when you're off cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just, you know, t- uh, Joe is recording a record right now with Billy Bragg okay. um, that's going to come out later oh, this cool. year. They're recording, um, I, f- I think it's just kind of loosely titled Train Songs right now, but they're taking a train from uh, Chicago to L.A. And oh, every great. stop, they're stopping at these train stations and they have an analog um, recording unit that's like strapped to someone's back with a with a microphone, and they're just capturing these songs along the way and, yeah. and, and getting, developing the story. So that'll happen this year, and that's a lot of fun. You know, that's uh, such a cre- I and mean, that's what artists need to do. Like we we're talking about the uh, you know the album on the river uh, on the dock, and, yeah. and doing that kind of thing. Like the creative, like what Foos did with Sonic Highways, and well, that was uh, crazy. Well, and, and I mean the and budget a for something like that. Huge undertaking. I mean, not everybody can do a full uh, HBO miniseries right. album, uh, you know, feature. But doing creative outside the box content, music related things is what's key because yeah. fans, every artist, like uh, Thirty Seconds at Mars, is great at that. It is like giving fans your true diehard something that they can't get anywhere else or from another artist well the last record joe put out um we actually worked on two albums uh three albums two albums maybe two and a half years ago which we haven't released at all they he recorded them live in the studio with a full band never really figured out how to mix them he wasn't happy um i think at some point he'll put them out but um you know, he, it was just, it drives him crazy when he doesn't have music out, mm. as you can tell with yeah. 13 albums released. So um, he had some tour dates booked for last year, last June, and uh, he ended up recording a record in two weeks with, you know, two of his buddies at his house uh, here in Eagle Rock. And we got that out immediately, and we gave it away for free to the fans um, up front. And then the paid download and the CD came out, and then the vinyl came out. So we, that's mm. not the, you know, there's another time where we made a record in three days, um, 2010, I want to say, and we give it away for the holidays. I mean, there's That's awesome. different yeah. things that we do, you know, because he can, we can. Yeah. Has Joe, has he had much radio success? Not really. Commercial success? No, because yeah. we we haven't hired a publicist in, since I met him, since mm-hmm. 10 years. We had somebody doing a little bit of uh, AAA radio back then. We kind of stripped away the entire music business from what we were doing, and just we did deals directly with iTunes. Um, we licensed on our own. There's a lot of things that you know. After a while, it's just been a two man operation with an agent. Yeah, and and uh, and that's great because I mean that's almost such a, a, a opposite to what's with you've been doing with Fitz, where yeah. there's a lot of radio promo. There's a lot of uh, those types of commercial things and there's lawyers and there's a label and but i like that i like that everything in my life is different because i get to stretch out in a lot of different ways you know i'm not going to all of a sudden go manage uh another joe purdy i'm not going to go manage another fitz i'm not going to go manage another who could manage another tim (laughs) right yeah um especially when he lights himself on fire um but uh i I like it it's a nice balance you're a lifer this is what you want to do yeah, so far. If you I mean, weren't managing, if you weren't in the music business, what would you do? I'd I'd be depressed. <laughs> no, I don't know. I have no idea. I'd be working at uh, Amoeba. <laughs> I don't. I probably. I'm. I'm also interested in marketing. So I, you know, I also and you do, do a lot. I mean, that's kind of a lot I of do what you some, do anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I've also been you know hired in the past to do some marketing. So I, I, I do like you know um, social media marketing. It's sure. kind of you know Evan and I do a little bit of that together um, here and there. Uh, I've been doing that for years with different artists and trying to kind of go from like that zero base to the first thousand to first five thousand and kind of, you know, figuring out what strategy that is with somebody. I I enjoy that. Without giving away all your trade secrets, what are some what are some kind of the basic things that you 
I can't tell you. No, I honestly it depends on what every case is what, different. Yeah, I think, and it should be. I mean, some of the uh, ideas and the uh, applications are very similar or the same, but it depends on what you have going on. And are there any hooks, or can we go find some hooks? And you know, those hooks can be you know having a placement here, or you know, um, a tour date here, whatever that is, and just to kind of get a little bit of fuel on the fire, a little bit of the kindling. Well, and a, and a lot of that, there's got to be uh, kind of a carrot at the end of the social media. It's like there's got to be a benefit to what you're doing online, I think. A lot of people encourage giveaways, like, you know, give away a download, give away something that uh, only your that, that is exclusive to you as an artist. Do you well, agree with that? I, I Look, I've, I agree with whatever works. I, I was hired by AWOL Nation in the beginning to help find their fans and, you know, uh, go out there and uh, collect email addresses. And I, and I did that, and I helped build their socials in the beginning and came kind of help, you know, come up with some of the ideas for uh, their social media. Mm. So, yeah, that worked for them then. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what works right now other than if I'm faced with something, I can help come up with a, a plan, you know. Yeah, and I mean, and it's amazing when you count out, like, SoundCloud, YouTube, Instagram, Tumblr. I mean, there's like 11, 12 sites that yeah. a band really should be on. You know? But uh, I do, I like, you know, if, if you're like kind of, you got like a very small fan base right now. I like sites like Noise Trade that is a music community. And if you get your music up there, and obviously I know somebody over there, and you know, I've paid for, you know, uh, some some spots in the email blast mm. it's beneficial because people want to go there and they know they're downloading music for free they know they're giving up an email address for that and so you can at least start with a quick base with that mm. and those people are all over the world right you know same with pledge pledge has a music community of, of music fans that are out there so once you do have some email addresses and you do have some fans to kind of talk to whether it's through you know your own social media or through um, something like Noise Trade, you combine it all and you bring it over to Pledge. And if you want to do something like that, you have something to kind of work with up right. front. You know? Yeah, I mean, there's so many tools like that popping up all the time. You know, know. every every Dude, there is a new music application every ten minutes, and it's and it's hilarious. It is really is, and you don't know who. It's that that's a crowded industry too, and you yeah. hope that. You know, and then you know South by just happens, and you hear about what's rising to the top, and yeah. a year from now, will it still be there? And you just have to sit back and kind of pay attention to what's going on, see what works for other people, and try things for yourself, and you know you find your your groove. You know, everything I was doing f- five years ago is completely outdated right now. I'm sure. Oh, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Three years ago was completely outdated. So you have to kind of keep continuing to know what what to do next. Um, well, one thing that hasn't really changed, and last thing we can talk about before I let you get on that uh, flight back to Malibu. <laughs> Look at my pilot right here. Yeah. But speaking of a platform that really hasn't changed is radio. Right. Um, still super important. I mean, everybody, it's it's becoming trickier and trickier to find tuners. More and more cars are not having them in their dash. But, like, how in your career – has Fits of the Tantrums been your closest working relationships with radio? Absolutely, and okay. especially recently. And what did you? And what was that experience? What was your over the last year and a half, two years? Like really learned from that? Well, it goes back maybe like four or five years. We, when when we were on Danger Bird Records, Jenny Sparandeo is well, yeah. What am I talking about? Because that was when the first time she, I interviewed. Yeah, she yeah. is a monster, and she worked her ass off, and she's great, and got us on radio. And uh, but what I learned was, you know. They everybody wants content. They all want you to come by and and meet everybody at the station, play a session. They 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 need you to come through and do things, and that's like kind of like the new payola. But it works. It, but we have a really <laughs> good relationship. Friend. No, but we were, we have a really good relationship with radio, and and, and uh, the band in, enjoys their relationship with radio. So it's it doesn't end up feeling like it sucks. You know, it sucks when you can't do everything when you're coming into a city because you have other things to do, and sometimes you might bum somebody out because you can't come by or whatever. But we try to make sure that we're available for everybody that we we're doing business with. They're talking about over the last four or five years of radio. What have you seen evolve? In the same regard to the music services, whether it's, uh, you know, working with iTunes, working with Pandora, Spotify, 
do you feel like those are kind of passive relationships? Is there is there a way? Whereas with well, radio, you can, have, you can have good relationships with them, and and we do. And is know? that is that does it benefit? On yeah, okay, absolutely does. Yeah. You know, you want to be as visible as possible, especially when you're releasing an album and when you're continuing to release release singles off the record, and you want to have a creative relationship in as many places as possible. Whether or not you know you get paid more from one more from one than the other, I mean, you know, we we do whatever we can. But even with the massive cumulative singles that Fitz has had, uh, you still look at like the cumulative aggregate number that ends up on the Spotify spreadsheet. Still pennies. I mean, it's still not. Oh, it's disgusting. It's it, bad. It's fucking bad. And Pandora is even worse in my mind. I mean, it's look, like a snake I'm, dinner. As a user, as, as a as a user, I can't even speak today. As a user, I love all these platforms. Um, I like Tidal the best because it's better sound quality, and I'm sure there's others out there that do that. But Tidal, Tidal, T I D A L. I have never. It's, yeah. it's lossless audio streaming. Okay. Okay. Um, I really like that, but yeah, I mean, I, look, I, we this maybe for a whole other thing, but um, the economics of it is sad. It really is, and you know, and the way these deals are being done, and the NDAs that the labels have with Spotify or Spotify has with the labels. I, I can't even tell which way the NDA goes, but it's not transparent. Yeah, sorry, about? the yeah. non-disclosure agreement. Yeah. Um, I can't tell which way the NDA is going, but when one entity, Spotify, is saying um, you have the labels have to be more transparent, and then the label is saying, "Well, we can't be transparent because of these ND- NDAs," something's really fucked up, you know. And well, when they're both getting, but there's there's a lot of money coming through, so you know, a, a label yeah, group. The question. Well, yeah. a label group will be advanced hundreds of millions of dollars for an X amount of period of time, maybe three years, let's say, and maybe I I, I don't have the facts together, all, but. This is my understanding. And so the idea is we want your catalog. We're going to give you hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, this other company is going to do the same thing too. And it's it's like any advance, you know. So if your catalog's used for X amount but there's a surplus left over, where does that surplus go? Do you go and spread that amongst the rest of your artists? Right. Like, like um, you know, like a, like a stockbroker. I, I, I don't think it works that way. Yeah. I'm not sure it works that way. Maybe it does. But um, right now it's a tech war, and all these tech companies have a lot of money. Apple has a lot of money, so I'm sure they're going to do really well as far as figuring their end out. Mm-hmm. But um, when it comes down to it, I was looking at I, – I couldn't even look at a statement. But if I were to look at a statement, um, I'll tell you that the royalty that – we have for fits with our label is it's based on our, like a regular download or a regular um, album sale for a stream. So they don't look at it as a license, you know, so people aren't getting paid as a license. This is kind of a, like a license in my mind, but there's a gray area. So, cause it's not ownership. Well, it, to me, it's a li- look to me. It's a license because Here's a company that's licensing your music, and someone's able to listen to the music based on that license. Right. A license is split differently in your royalty deal than a sale. So your sale is based on a point structure that's determined, you know. Right, because it's not, it's like, you know, going over to your friend's house to listen to music, and they have every single song. You don't have to. You might, I, you know what I mean. It's, I understand where you're, where you're going with well, it. Well, I'm just saying, you know, I don't think bands are being um, compensated properly. No, absolutely not. That's the bottom line. That's the fucking bottom line. Yeah. is that because it's it, fractions of a penny out of yeah, a dollar. You know, yeah. and I think labels look at it as okay. Well, we're just looking at it as a dollar that comes in, and we're going to split that dollar the way the same way we would have split that dollar if it would have been a download. It's not the same thing. Yeah. I don't think so, and especially when you're seeing millions of streams come through and artists who are huge looking at it going, fuck is this? Yeah. You know? Whatever. Do you think I, there I are, love streaming you think at the same gonna, time. Well, yeah, do you, but do you think there's ever going to be a, kind of a cumulative uproar like Taylor Swift pulled her music off there? There's been a handful of artists that have pulled their music. But she can. Up, she, but, she, but what, she, if she doesn't do something, her whole label starves. So the, the the last, I guess, kind of uh, to bring it in full circle, taking a, a band, and Fitz is a good example because they've had the commercial mainstream radio success. If you take a pie like this and you'd have about that much of the of the slice of the pie that would come from ASCAP, Spotify, Pandora, where everything else is going to be merch, touring, syncing, that's where 
the bulk of everybody's paying their bills from, right? Yeah, but I think it's always kind of been that way too. Well, not not the way it was twenty years ago. I know we were talking about, but you know what? Here's the argument of twenty years ago. Um, You know, you also spent four hundred thousand dollars on a video times three. You also you spent so much money on shit where that's not happening anymore. But that, but you knew that that four hundred thousand dollar video that you're going to put on MTV is going to seem be seen by millions. No, you don't, because it could flop. Well, it could be flop. True. You know, I mean, that was kind of like putting a song at, at at radio. Sure. But you had, uh, I, I mean, radio MTV was really influential in selling music as much as radio. I oh, think, absolutely, back in the day. absolutely. Uh, and it was a justifiable cost. You know, you spent sure. however much on the record, however much on the video, and and then you go tour and sell records. If you were on TRL, holy shit, that was Do it. You remember that? Yeah. And I I knew uh, somebody who used to early on ha- developed the script. To vote for an artist and got him like number one on TRL a bunch of times and broke that record. That was insane. Wait, what happened? They wrote a script where you can go to the website and put, you know, and. Oh, like and a run programming the, script. Yeah, run the script. We're in Hollywood. Fucking, I was thinking of oh, screenplay. Oh, hey. <laughs> wrote a script about it. Uh, yeah. No, um, and just, yeah, blew that artist up. But it, Did it you remember crazy. who it was? No, I, I, I probably shouldn't say, but. It was weird. That's brilliant. You know, was That's social totally, media marketing. <laughs> totally. I mean, the guy. I mean, for, That's online for what it's worth, he did that. He did a good job. Yeah. Uh, it's a fucking crazy business, man. Fuck this yeah, is it fun. Is. Uh, Thank you, Brian Klein, uh, manager extraordinaire. I, I won't send you're any, too good. I won't send anybody your your way. You don't need any more uh, artists no, I don't. knocking on your door. But we will plug your wife. Okay. Arielverenis dot com v e r i n i s. Um, yeah, she's badass. Come check it out. You've plugged her more than me today. It's Darren Rose. Thank you guys for hanging out. It's Darren Rose Music Network dot com. This is Inside Radio and Records. Brian Klein. Thanks again, buddy. You got it, man. Thank you for your time.